Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry, it's my fault that we're running late, so I apologize. Uh, I'm Councilmember Keith Powers. I'm chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice. Today, we're conducting a hearing on the Department of Corrections justice system. Uh, and I want to just, before uh, I go into my opening statements, I want to just uh, acknowledge Councilmember Holden and Councilmember Ampre Samuel. Um, I know Councilmember Ampre Samuel has a bill on today's agenda. I'll forego my opening statement if you want to give. You're good? Okay. Um, well, thank you everybody for being here today um, to talk about the grievance system <coughs> in the Department of Correction. Um, you know, all people who are incarcerated are uh, have the right to bring a complaint when they are denied access to their basic needs. And it is important that we give them a simple and easy to navigate process to do that. While the DOC has established the Office of Constituent and Grievance Services to deal with a large volume of grievances made in DOC facilities, the Board of Corrections and others have voiced the department should do more to effectively address the grievances of incarcerated people. In June 2019, the Board of Corrections issued its second annual assessment of the grievance system. In that assessment, the board reported problems with access, finding significant disparities in the number of grievance boxes in each facility, and other issues which we're here to address today. Uh, others have also testified about their client's inability to access or understand the grievance process. So given these issues, it should come as no surprise that the Board of Corrections reported an increase in grievances made through 311. We do, however, see that DOC has taken steps to improve the grievance process, most recently enacting an internal directive addressing some of the concerns that we mentioned earlier. We are interested here today to hear about implementation of that new directive and how the committee and the city council can help ensure that the DOC has the resources it needs to carry it out effectively. I know that the board and advocates will have suggestions on how to make the grievance process more accessible, and I urge the department to stay and to take those suggestions into careful consideration. We will also be hearing three bills today that will uh, are aimed at improving the grievance process. We'll be hearing a bill from Councilmember Ayala, uh, Introduction 1340, which will require the DOC to make the grievance process more efficient by creating a central system where it can track all complaints and give regular access to the Board of Corrections. We will also be, uh, it will also ensure greater access to the grievance process by requiring a number of grievance boxes to be placed in each unit and will require the DOC to install electronic complaint kiosks by the year 2021. The second is a bill introduced by me, uh, Introduction 1370, which will ensure that all complaints made by incarcerated individuals or on behalf of incarcerated individuals to 311 will be made subject to the grievance review program. Additionally, it will ensure the department informs every incarcerated individual in writing about the grievance process and about protections against retaliation for filing a grievance. Finally, it will require the Department of Health and Mental Health to ensure that any health care provider it contracts with to provide medical and health services to incarcerated individuals to respond to medical complaints within five business days. Finally, Councilmember Ampre Samuel's bill, Introduction 1334, will require the Board of Corrections to conduct a survey regarding the correctional system's grievance process. Uh, with that being said, I'll hand it over to Councilmember Ampre Samuel to say a few words. But I want to thank my staff and the staff here at the, at the Council for helping us to put together today's hearing. And uh, with that, we will ask Councilmember Ampre Samuel to say a few words on her bill. Thank you, Chair Powers, for allowing me this opportunity to speak on Intro 1334. This bill will require the Board of Correction to conduct a survey on Department of Corrections grievance and complaint process and then publish a report of their findings and recommendations for improving the procedures. If this is established, the procedures would be for those who are being held or confined by DOC. The surveys would solicit information related to gender and racial group of the individual completing the survey, location of occurrence, number of complaints filed by such persons, satisfaction level of the grievance and appeals process, and whether incident was actually addressed. This will be an annual survey and shall include recommendations for improvements. After visiting local jails over the past year and listening to DOC explain their process for addressing harassment and abuse in their facilities, this triggered the need to do more. And this bill is not far-fetched because it's a direct response to the recommendations made by the Board of Correction. We've read the statistics that state people in custody have unequal access to the complaint system depending on the jail in which they are housed. Facilities range in the number of grievance boxes they have and the grievance coordinator's workloads 
very dependently, de very dramatically dependent on the facility to which they are assigned. People in custody are not informed about protections against retaliation for filing complaints. And in FY 2017, we learned that only 0.4% of the people have appealed any grievance decisions rendered. It's unclear from the data provided by DOC how many people completed all levels of the appeal process. And there were situations where DOC did not properly time stamp a significant number of complaints, thus making it challenging to track compliance with informal resolution and subsequent response deadlines. And 41% of all cases audited had no time stamp required, as required by DOC policy. With so many missing holes um, for something that is so critical, there is obviously a need for a better tracking and monitoring system. Now, going through the whole procedure process and the appeal process, you know, we kind of joked amongst ourselves saying that, you know, I have a law degree. And just looking at the system and the process is complicated for me as someone that knows the law and understands policies. So I just can't imagine somebody who is going through a stressful situation having to go through all of um, the different steps. So again, this is based on recommendations from the Board of Correction. It will also require the BOC to conduct the surveys of individuals filing the grievances. So with everything that's going to be said and heard today, I just look forward to working with the board to ensure we can create a survey that will be manageable given this current resources. I do understand that. But the main purpose is to ensure that people are heard, and this provides another avenue for filing a complaint. This is a no-brainer bill, and I hope to see the support of it in passing by the full council. So thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, and um, we will go ahead, we will swear in, if you can raise your hands, and we'll have the council swear you in. Thanks. Do you, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Great, thank you. If, if you don't mind just starting by just giving us your name and your titles, each, each of one of you, and then you can start with your testimony. James Boyd, I'm the Director of Constituent and Grievance Services at the New York City Department of Correction. Okay. Acting thank Bureau you. Chief of Facility Operations, New York City Department of Correction. Okay, thank you. You can be in your testimony. Good morning, Chair, pa Chair Powers and members of the Criminal Justice Committee. Thank you for this great opportunity to discuss the Department of Corrections inmate grievance system. My name is James Boyd. I am the Director of Constituent and Grievance Services at the New York City Department of Correction. Joining me is Becky Scott, Acting Bureau Chief of Facility Operation, who has over 25 years with DOC. Also joining us in the audience are our Grievance Coordinator and Grievance Officer from the Rose M. Singer Center. Today I will briefly walk you through the Department's grievance system, current reform efforts already underway, and our plans for future improvement. I will also comment on Intro Bill 1334, Intro Bill 1340, and Intro Bill 1370, the three bills being considered today. Though now consolidated under the OCGS, the department originally had two units as outlets for detainees and inmate complaints, the Inmate Grievance Resolution Program, IGRP, and the Office of Constituent Services, OCS. IGRP was the initial office created in the 1980s to serve as the outlet for individuals in DOC's custody to file their grievances. This process was paper-based and inmates and detainees were only allowed to file their complaints directly with grievance staff in the facility. In 2011, the department created the Office of Constituent Services and launched a pilot that captured grievances made to 311. The pilot was successful and it allowed constituent service staff to receive and respond to inmate complaints seven days a week. The complaint was sent directly from 311 to the constituent service email address and a notification was sent to OCS staff's email account. This efficient and paperless process also made it easier for OCS to aggregate and improve the DOC's ability to report on trends and metrics. However, two offices had difficulty reconciling duplicate grievances made by inmates who used both the 311 system and filed paper grievances, which slowed down the grievance process, delayed resolution, and frustrated officers working in the facilities. In 2017, these two offices merged to form the Office of Constituent and Grievance Services. OCGS is comprised of dedicated public servants, both uniform and non-uniform staff, with years of service spanning from three years to 40 years working in a department. This merger was a reflection of the department's commitment to improve and be innovative in capturing and resolving inmate complaints. Since the creation of OCGS, the department has used a technological system to track the life cycle of complaints known as Service Desk. 
The application of service desk was a bold and innovative step DOC and it enabled OCGS to electronically create and assign inmate complaints. This system allows OCGS to centralize all inmate complaints, grievances, and requests, regardless of the method the inmate submitted the complaint, either via grievance staff, including 311, mail, advocates, or third parties. Service Desk promotes transparency, accountability, and improves the agency's response times to inmate complaints. To further ensure DOC is properly tracking and reviewing the quality of work in the system, OCGS created a quality assurance unit to support and monitor reporting efforts. In addition to, re to reforms made to structure of OCGS, the department also made important changes to its directives and forms. These changes were made collaboratively with staff on the ground and our colleagues at the Board of Correction. The updated grievance system was created as a joint collaboration between the DOC and the BOC. It was designed to provide individuals in DOC's custody the opportunity to file issues regarding their confinement through a structured and expedient process. The grievance process is designed to reduce conflict and litigation while providing the department with information concerning facility operations that would help it maintain a safe and secure environment. In addition, as updates to the directive were rolled out, the department also regularly engaged with legal advocates to keep them informed of DOC's efforts to discuss their concerns. In 2016, BOC released a study of the department's grievances system, and the department has since implemented many of these recommendations, including utilizing a technological system designed to track the life cycle of all complaints from inception to completion, creating consistent weekly reports, increasing responsiveness to inmate complaints, hiring additional grievance coordinators and grievance officers to support this effort, circulating new posters in the facilities to promote awareness on how to file a complaint, revising the current grievance directive to ensure policy is aligned with practice, and updating grievance forms. BOC recommended biannual updates with OCGS to discuss ongoing efforts to improve the grievance process, but the department instead proposed meetings on a quarterly basis due to the importance of this work. The department's new directive on an inmate grievance procedure went into effect in December 2018. The updated directive includes additional language about the 311 process, new appeal levels, service desk system, and how to handle specific complaints. In addition, the inmate statement form and categories were printed for the first time in 10 different languages, including French, Mandarin, and Bengali. In an effort to ensure everyone in DOC's custody learned about the new procedures, OCGS attended a recent inmate council meeting. A poster explaining the new process also has been drafted and will be printed and hung in all housing areas in the coming weeks. Inmates have multiple outlets to file their complaint. Since 2015, calls to 311 have been free for the inmate population, expanding access for inmates to file a complaint. Although 311's citywide customer service standard requires city agencies to provide a response within 14 days, the department mandated a seven-day turnaround for facilities and units to provide acknowledgments or responses to inmates' issues using our inmate complaint system. There are 40 categories for individuals in DOC custody to file their complaints, and these complaints can fall under a grievable category or subject to the grievance process, or non-grievable category and not subject to the grievance process. OCGS staff processes all inmate complaints regardless if the complaint is grievable or non-grievable. All non-grievable issues are forwarded to the appropriate unit for further review and are then entered and processed through our service desk system. To submit a grievance, the inmate population can file a grievance with the grievance staff in the facility, drop the grievance in the grievance boxes in their facility, or visit the grievance office. Inmates must write their grievance and requested outcome on the inmate statement form and sign the form. The new inmate statement form now also includes additional information on the back of the form about the appeal process in all grievance categories. Grievable issues can be appealed, whereas non-grievable issues cannot. If the complaint is not a grievable issue like inmate account, employment, or property, then grievance staff will have seven business days to investigate the issue and provide a resolution. If the inmate is not satisfied with the resolution, then they may appeal the decision and it escalates to that facility's warden. The warden have five business days to review the grievance and supporting documents and either affirm or reject the grievance staff decision or inmate's request. If the inmate is not satisfied with the warden's decision, then they can appeal to the assistant chief. 
The assistant chief would also have five days to review the grievance staff uh, decision and the warden's decisions and either affirm or reject the grievance. If the inmate is not satisfied with the assistant chief's decision, then they can appeal to the Central Office Review Committee. The CRRC is comprised of the Chief of Department, General Counsel, Assistant Commissioner for Strategic Initiatives, and myself. The BOC also provides a recommendation to the CRRC on the inmate grievance for review and consideration. The CRRC constitute as the department's final decision on inmate grievances. The 311 system is available to individuals within DOC's care and any member of the public with a loved one detained in one of our city's jails. If the department receives a complaint from an inmate or third party on behalf of an inmate with concerns about their safety, then it's sent directly to the facility staff and their security team for further handling and tracking the OCGS electronic complaint system until OCGS receive an acknowledgement or it's resolved. Where the, inmate, uh, where the nature of the 311 call addresses a non-grievable subject matter, i.e. use of force, that is a responsibility of a division of DOC other than OCGS to investigate and resolve. OCGS tracks the complaint in its electronic system, but the content and the outcome of the investigation exists within the databases and systems of the investigating division. All units tasked to address complaints and service desks have seven calendar days to acknowledge they are handling the complaint or to provide a response to OCGS. Then OCGS supervisory staff will close the complaint. When complaints are not handled within the seven-day time frame, Units, including the facilities, will receive a daily notice in their email until they address the complaint in the system. OCGS also sends all wardens weekly reports that includes their average response times to complaints, any outstanding complaints, top 10 complaints for the week, top three housing areas filing complaints, and the complaint volume. The facility's respective assistant chief is also copied on his communication. In addition, the Bureau Chief of Facility Operations, Bureau Chief of Security, and Chief of Department also receives a weekly report with the aforementioned indicators to monitor performance and responsiveness. In recent months, OCGS also improved upon how grievance information is reported to facility and agency leadership. The department recognizes that data on inmate complaints is a valuable management tool for wardens to reduce inmate tension and address institutional problems. To that end, OCGS new grievance reports provide uniform leadership, including the chief of department, weekly, monthly, and quarterly data to track complaint trends, volume, and response times for all facilities. The department is ready to is ready doing many reforms called for in Bill Intro 1370. For example, the updated inmate statement form now includes information on the appeals process. Additionally, 311 complaints are already part of the grievance process as per the direct department's directive. Depending on the nature of the inmate complaint, the OCGS hub team sends any grievance received via 311 to OCGS staff to check if the inmate has already filed a grievance in regards to the complaint. If there is no grievance on file, the OCGS staff will look into the complaint and then provide the inmate with a resolution within seven business days, similar to a grievance filed on paper. If the OCGS hub team receives a 311 complaint from an inmate that is not subject to the grievance process, they shall task it out in service desk to the appropriate unit for handling. All units within service desk have seven days to respond and close their correspondence in the system and provide the inmate with an acknowledgement. The department has zero tolerance for anyone who prevents an inmate from filing a complaint or acts of retaliation because they filed a complaint as stated in our directive. The, part, the department also instituted multiple pathways for an individual to report if they feel they have been retaliated against as a result of filing a grievance. Currently, inmates do not receive a formal acknowledgement from the department for 311 complaints that are considered non-grievable. 311 staff provides inmates with a correspondence number to confirm their, their complaint was submitted to the department. The department is actively working on a plan to devise an efficient way to provide inmates with an acknowledgement for non-grievable 311 complaints. However, all 311 complaints are logged in a department's electronic OCGS complaint system, reviewed by OCGS staff, and either resolved by OCGS staff or forwarded to the appropriate area of concern within the department for investigation and resolution. 
The department supports the intention of intro bill 1370, but would like to work with the council to identify the most effective means of commu communicating with inmates about the appeal process. The department supports the spirit of intro bill 1340, but have some concerns. Specifically, the department supports the idea of additional grievance boxes. However, we would like to work with the council to discuss ways to discuss the best placement of grievance boxes focusing on highly trafficked areas. However, DOC has concerns about the information sharing in this bill and believes DOC is prohibited to share certain grievance concerns due to HIPAA regulations. Lastly, while the department supports innovative methods of communicating with inmates about the status of their grievances, the aging state of our existing facilities alone make the technological objectives of this bill, which would necessitate the complex installation of Wi-Fi throughout the facilities, incredibly time-consuming and costly to achieve. Furthermore, the Council and the Board of Correction have expressed strong interest in seeing the department develop a case management system for PREA cases and improve the electronic tracking of a number of other metrics, including our bill process. Development and implementation of another central technological management solution will place a strain on our limited technological resources and will likely so slow the development and implementation of these other important projects. The department and BOC have a good working relationship, especially when it comes to our efforts to better address grievances. As such, the department does not believe this mandated survey is, is needed. The department already publicly posts quarterly reports about the grievance process as required by Local Law 87 of 2015. The most recent is enclosed. The BOC also has access to the department's inmate complaint system, and the board can review all inmate complaints at any time, which enhances our collaborative efforts and better enables both agencies to improve the grievance system. In addition, DOC currently shares information with BOC on a weekly and monthly basis. Although, although the department has made substantial strides in improving the grievance system, there are always more that we can do. OCGS continues to monitor the service desk system and refine it in order to better capture pertinent information and align it with new changes within the current grievance process. OCGS also randomly audits grievance staff's work for quality assurance purposes and to ensure their efforts are consistent with the grievance directive. The department is continuously working to address primary complaints and intend to develop a strategic plan on how to best tackle these issues. DOC is also working closely with our academy to revise the curriculum as it relates to grievances and improve pre-promotional -pre trainings for captains, assistant deputy wardens on the inmate grievance system and their role in addressing inmate issues. The department appreciates the council's interest and support in this very important work we look forward to continue working with the council to improve the inmate grievance system and extend an opportunity to the council to visit our grievance staff. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I want to note that we've also been joined by uh, Councilmember Rivera as well. Um, so thank you for the testimony. I want to start just with a few questions on the bills and your comments on the bills. <clears throat> um, first on 1370, the uh, just a comment to talk about the most effective means of communicating with inmates about the appeals process, which sounds like a concern that you, there's a concern about how to do that. Is that what what is the concern on how to communicate yes. with the inmate population? Yeah. Well, what we've done with the new inmate statement form is provide that information on the back of the inmate statement form. So previously, the inmate statement form was one sided. Now it's double sided. So it's very so this information is very transparent on the back of the inmate statement form. So they have this information firsthand in addition to all of the grievance categories that's listed on the back of the form. And is this information, is, could, is it in the inmate handbook as well? It will be, we'll be adding a new insert in the inmate handbook. Okay. And, and you're doing that or you've done it or when when is that? I have to follow up, but I can <clears throat> check on the status. Okay. And the on bill 1340, a concern around uh, the cost and I guess the limited resources relate to technology. Can you talk to us more about the concerns? And, um, you know, I don't necessarily view, I understand from a resources standpoint, we don't certainly view all these things to be competitive with each other, but I understand there's limited resources. Has, just so, we talk about case management system for PREA um, and approving electronic tracking on a number of other metrics, other, uh, is the agency asking for more resources this year to implement any of that or, or otherwise, ask for uh, other resources to 
be compliant with a bill like this or otherwise? And what, what is the agency asking for then in case, in case of the other things we're talking about? So I definitely, I, I, we do believe, you know, technology will always help make this process more efficient, but I think we want to, you know, have an opportunity to, t to look at what um, technological interface with the inmate population would look like um, and, you know, take some time and uh, definitely engage the council as we uh, flesh out the details of what that could possibly look like um, in the facilities. Okay. Um, our staff will follow up to talk about <clears throat> the three bills that, um, that are, are being heard today. Um, I want to start just, just with a stat that jumped out to me and caused concern around um, the grievance process. And I was hoping you could make, give, maybe give us some insight on this, which is that in, in the Board of Corrections found 41% of forms were not time stamped. 58% did not indicate if the grievance rejected or accepted the, camp complain, the, complain, the claim and 64% were missing a signature. You know, th I think those cause them concern, it certainly caused us, us concern and makes it difficult to understand the compliance and whether um, the, the person filing the grievance was, was happy with the resolution, wanted to appeal it, or other information, including even if they were, <clears throat> you know, if they're aware of it because there's no signature on it. Can you, can you tell us why the department is not getting even basic information, not time stamping, not, not having uh, forms filled out about whether it was rejected or accepted. Mm -hmm. that, seems to be, uh, that seems to be an important part of this process and leaves folks like us or the board without a real understanding of what's happening when there's not basic information. Can you explain to us why that information is missing and, and what steps you're taking to, to make sure that that information is not missing in the future? Um, so this is an area of the, of, of the board study we're in agreement in terms of simplifying a grievance forms, and this is actually what we've done to make sure it's a little more transparent, make sure it's, um, you know, simplified language for the MA population to know what the process is. Uh, they have to sign the form now uh, because previously there wasn't really no mandate for them to sign a form, and I think we wanted to make this more of a standard process that if we were going to look into your grievance that you had to affirm by signing the form. Uh, but in regards to the timestamps, you know, <coughs> staff had timestamps. It, it was as simple as getting new ink for the timestamps. So, you know, we are in full compliance of ensuring that staff do have operational timestamps in the facilities. My team every week are pulling grievances out of our system to do some quality assurance to make sure that staff is signing, inmates are signing, and that these documents are timestamped. So this is something that we're always looking at. But uh, just, to, just to follow up on that, we're saying 41% of forms are not timestamped because the department didn't have ink? I mean, this, I think this is the area where we're moving away from. I think this is the, the, the BOC's um, narrative and their study is what we're working from. Um, you know, there could have been resource issues uh, when both units were separate. Uh, but this is where we're trying to move it away from and provide greater oversight with our staff and make sure that they're in compliance with the directive. This is my role. This is my supervisory's team role to ensure that all forms are clearly documented in the system, uh, signed and time stamped as well. Um, but I don't want to say that they did not have any time stamps. It could have, I'm just saying it could have been as simple that they knew, needed new ink. Um, you know, at, at that appropriate time that the information was being shared with the Board of Correction. I say this with all respect, but I, I think mm -hmm. you should understand my concern if mm -hmm. we're not be able to have an understanding of whether somebody was receiving, if, with these, because this process works on a time frame of mm -hmm. when you have to receive, um, uh, when you have to receive a response from the Department of Corrections, if, if we're fine, I mean, if, if part of this answer is we don't have ink, but certainly there's, I'm sure there's other parts of it that would raise mm -hmm. a real concern mm -hmm. for us. and. Um, I think that when we find out, for instance, I, and I, I will mention, I mean, I, I have a copy of the form. The form is not that, to me, that complicated mm -hmm. to understand um, uh, in terms of where to check rejected, accepted in terms of the claim. And it, it seems like the DOC is just out of compliance with it. Um, and <clears throat> and I, I don't think I've heard a response in terms of why we can't get and, and of course, this is part of an audit, so I know that it, it, so perhaps the numbers uh, uh, wholesale are, are a bit different, but it does seem to me like we're well out of compliance or well out of 
what the process should look like. But I'm not. I'm still not sure if I understand why, for instance, 42% of people of the of the uh, cases audited didn't get somebody able to even say whether they rejected or accepted the complaint. I mean, so we can't. You know, MA has to be willing to. You know, sign the form. Um, but you know, it goes back to ensuring that you know staff is doing their due diligence and you know, overseeing that responsibility to make sure that we're in compliance with our directive. Um, you know, we would have to look at the snapshot of when the board looked at this information, but again, this is the system that we're working away from to make sure that we're in compliance of this work and make sure that you know, staff is completing the forms thoroughly. And you, like, for the signature, for instance, why, why is a signature necessary for, on the form? For the MA. Yeah. I think it's another way to affirm that, you know, for all parties that you want our receipt of uh, providing your statement and um, you're affirming that you want somebody to look into this matter. I don't think we want to start taking forms. It, it wouldn't be good standard, good practice to take forms that are not signed. Uh, we, I, I agree with you. Yeah. But 36% aren't signed, and that's, the, that's an issue. Right. And, I, and again, council member, this is the system we're working away from. Um, that I think that's not going to be the case going forward as we have new grievance forms. And with this system being so transparent, we can do random audits ourselves to look at this work. Uh, really prior to the system, you know, there, you know it was a more of a paper-based system. So with the use of this new technological system, at any time from our desktops, we can randomly audit staff just to make sure they're in compliance of those simple measures of making sure that the inmates sign the form, staff sign the form, and these documents are time stamped. Okay, and how, of, do, how often is DOC planning to do audits? As, as frequent as possible. Every day, I mean, that, yeah, every I mean, this information's accessible right on our desktops so at any time. I mean, I definitely know the system's always up and running on, on my desktop at all times. So you can always check, you know, who's doing what, what they're putting into the system. You can click on it in real time to see what the documents documents they're uploading into the system. So, um, you know, this is part of somewhat of a day-to-day -day task. I mean, we've kind of baked this in into the way we um, look at our work on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Um can we talk just about the length of the process for a second, since we were just talking about the timestamps and, and, and representation of time? Um, the, there's a new, I know you guys put some new steps into the process and edited the process in terms of the, for the grievance process. A, can you just tell us some of the changes that were made in terms of the process for appealing and filing grievance and appealing? And second, any consideration to the timeline, the, the length? I think today the whole process can take about 10 weeks. I, you know, a lot of steps in that process. Mm -hmm. Um, any consideration to making that process shorter or or less steps involved in order to get a sort of a re resolution to if you want to go through the full appeal process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think this is work we're always going to have to evolve. This is work we're always going to evolve to figure out what's efficient, what's working, what's not working. So the appeals process is something that we're always going to consider to figure out if we need to refine. And obviously, we want to simplify it. Uh, both for staff as well as for, for the inmate population. Um, we don't want to make the process uh, inefficient. Um, but what was your first question? I'm sorry. My first question, just talk to us about the changes that were made in terms of the, pro the actual process, the appeals process. Uh, so we, uh, the original appeals process uh, mandated staff schedule hearings, uh, which, uh, and they would have to schedule hearings with the inmate and you know other parties to come down to the grievance office, which could be very uh, time consuming uh, and not the best use of, of time considering, you know, what the inmate shared on the inmate statement form is usually sufficient information for you to look into their complaint. So we removed that process as an appeals process and added the assistant chief as an, another appeal level after the warden because we feel like, you know, it's by, you know, it was a big leap in the appeals process for uh, appeal to go from the warden to the CRC. And, you know, in all fairness, I think adding another stake and su supervisory support, especially from the assistant chief who supervises multiple facilities, would add a layer of support and they can look at this uh, through these complaints through the lens of all of their operations that's under their purview, not just that particular facility where they're getting this appeal. Okay. And can you tell us how many appeals happened at each level last year? Give me one second. 
So last year, in calendar year 2018, we had one uh, appeal to the warden's office and no appeals, and one appeal to the CRC. Sorry, say that again. So mm -hmm. one, none to the CRC. One, one to the CRC. One to the C. And one to the warden's office. And one to the warden's office. And how about the commanding officer division? How about that's the, that's the that's the warden, the commanding officer. The, okay, sorry. Yeah. And how many how many to the commanding officer? Just one. Just one. That seems incredibly low. Why is that? I mean, it's the inmates' discretion if they want to appeal. Sometimes inmates are could be not satisfied with the resolution, but then feel like they don't need to appeal. Like, and, and that's to their discretion if they feel like they want to. Uh, escalate the complaint to another level but um you know it is accessible to them if they feel like they want to you know escalate their complaint but um it's not it's not a it's not a frequent occurrence where you have a lot of inmates appealing their grievances how, how many total how many total grievances did you get for calendar year 20 yeah well, yeah Nine thousand two hundred and fifty one. Nine thousand two hundred and fifty one. And only one appealed? It seems it seems low beyond belief. What is, I don't even I have to even think about what even percentage of that is. I mean doesn't that make doesn't that strike you to think that the appeals process itself has some issue related to it? I I'm I'm not mm -hmm. just speculating that, you know, if nine thousand two hundred and fifty one filed a grievable complaint, mm -hmm. that's what that number represents, mm -hmm. and only one appealed. That would strike me as either uh, an issue with folks not knowing exactly how to go through the appeals process or some other obstacle related to the appeals process. Um, because I don't know any institution where 9,251 mm -hmm. people would complain about something and then only one would decide to appeal it. If I can interject, so sure. the total amount in regards to our total population, we have several inmates that file multiple, multiple grievances. So this is not representative of one per inmate, per se. You may have some that are re repeatedly filing grievances on every level. In addition, having served as a warden with the department, we have other mechanisms to engage the population than this process. We have inmate council meetings. Our staff are touring the facilities. The department is engaged. So a lot of issues are addressed prior to this process. So when inmates have issues, and the programming staff deals with this as well. So there are other platforms for the population to have issues and concerns addressed. I understand that, but 9,000 people did decide to participate in that process, and so, and only one decided that it was worth doing an appeal on. So I, I, it just strikes me as incredibly, an incredibly low percentage that are going through that process and perhaps is not reflective just of people who are, well, actually, follow-up question to that is how many people filed grievances last year? Individually? Yeah. We would have to break that out. Okay. I can follow up with you. Um, my, my point just being that, you know, I, I understand people make multiple complaints and perhaps not everybody wants to go through the process and not everybody wants to go through an appeals process and there are other ways to do it. Again, it just strikes me as a, a low number relative to the, enti the entire, the large number. <clears throat> and um, it, it does at least warrant a look at whether the people have a full understanding of the appeals process, whether it's complicated, whether it mean, whether they can go through that process on their own or need somebody to help them with that process, whether it, you know, whether there's transparency around it. Um, it does, uh, to me, just pick a question about the disparity, the, the discrepancy between those who start that process and and uh, those who decide to appeal. I just wanted to ask another question uh, sort of related to this, which is um, I have your stats from the second quarter of 2019, um, which I assume are maybe the, the, the most recent available stats. You have a number that is um, 12 informally resolved grievances that went, so you have, I'll just read these out, 14 withdrawn, 23 transfer discharge, 12 informally resolved, 1094 resolved at formal level, zero at warden's level, zero at CO, CORC. Um, what does informally resolved represent? Um, I'm sorry, council member, if I may. Yes. 
speak to the prior point of yeah, sure. uh, the number, the volume. So for calendar year 2018, a total of 20 inmates accounted for 2,100 filed grievances. 20 for 2,100, okay. So that's just 20 inmates out of the department, over 2,000 grievances combined between them. Okay. So just to give some context. Yeah, I, thank you for that. Thank you for getting that, that statistic quickly. Um, and just wanted to, so to informally resolved, can you explain what that means? It means it was resolved on a formal level uh, from the grievance coordinator or the grievance officer. Uh, we changed the verbiage in our directive to formal. Basically means the same thing. We just felt like uh, informal uh, might have been not the most best way to define how it was used. I mean, we prefer... Uh, to use the term informally by um, saying that inmates could informally uh, get their issues addressed by the housing area officers, but for the grievance process, we now use the, de the, the word formal resolution, not informal. So we'll be updating this report as well. Okay. Um, can you talk to us, what, what, are the, what are the top five categories of grievable, what are, which categories of grievable offenses are they your top five that receive the most Complaints. So it varies, uh, but historically, what we've seen as uh, the top five uh, grievable complaints is usually inmate account, employment, property, um, m medical, and uh, sometimes commissary. Okay, and staff. Staff is a non-grievable, but that is, we see, you know, some complaints, considerable okay. volume complaints on staff. Okay. And when you say those are top five, those are your, those are based on last year's numbers or they're, you're sharing anecdotally, what are the? Anecdotally, but I can share, thank you. Okay. I can share last year. So in calendar year 2018, the top five grievances, kind of as I mentioned just briefly, was employment, medical, staff, inmate account, and classification. Okay. And do you have 2017? Employment, staff, inmate account, medical, and jail time. So similar for the similar two years. Friends, yeah. So when you receive year after year, if you see similarities in terms of how many mm -hmm. complaints you're getting, in terms of which ones register the highest categories, um, uh, what steps does DOC take mm -hmm. to look at those issues? Because if they're, if they're the frequent flyers in terms of the issues that keep popping up in terms of complaints, does that trigger any process if they're repetitive? and if they're similar year after year, and, and what does steps does DOC take to address those if they're not, if it starts to appear like these are, these are re, you know, repetitive ones over the years, and it's not, it's, you know, it, it would seem to want to raise uh, uh, steps beyond just responding to individual and maybe more systematic citywide um, response. Can you tell us if that triggers any particular process or how DOC handles with the ones that are sort of year after year complaints? So as a commanding officer and or chief of a division, I will look at these categories to determine if what is driving this category and what's needed to abate it. And that's done in twofold. So I have meetings with my leadership team in the facility and perhaps if in a facility and jail time is a high uh, category. Then I meet with my team that's assigned for that function and find out where's the breakdown. Is it reporting the information to the population? Is it a resource issue of not getting this done? What exactly is driving? And a part of that conversation has to include the inmates as well. So again, that would be something that I would look at. So for classification, inmate accounts, and medical, those are meetings that we meet every single week, and then this is what would be on the agenda to perhaps flesh out for medical what exactly is the issue. Is it access or is it care? And that's something I will collaborate with the medical team to um, get to the bottom of. And then there's obviously some indicators that would be an overriding concern. If there's a sexual assault allegation or anything of that nature, those are prior prioritized. Anything that's concerning a safety issue is prioritized and that's dealt with immediately. So that these are decisions, this is information that would drive a resource if it's necessary, but definitely to resolve it because there's this domino effect in the facility. Okay. And, um, okay, thank, thank you for, for that answer. I just want to, about uh, one that you, I think you mentioned and we saw was jail sentence calculations. What are, what is that? I mean, that is essentially about somebody disputing how much time. They so the inmate population 
has a range of skill set in calculating their own incarceration time. So that often comes down to having a meeting and for them to review their custodial time. And that may include other jurisdictions. And then we have to also liaison with custody management to confirm all custodial time that you may have had in other jurisdictions or in our custody or in a hospital setting where you're under confinement to give you the proper credit. Often it just involves getting a jail time certificate to confirm their um, custody time. Okay. Um, I want to come back, but I want to hand it over to Councilor Holden, who I know has some a few questions. Yeah, so thank you for your testimony. Chief, I'd like to ask you a question on um, uh, officers. Let's say, and, 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 your, uh, and in testimony, we heard that the department has zero tolerance for anyone who prevents an inmate from filing a complaint or acts of retaliation. Um, how many officers were reprimanded for that? Do we have we have a number on that? I don't have that number with me. Okay, sir. can you get, get that for us? Because yes. uh, we want it. If there's if you're demo, if you're saying you're, there's zero tolerance, we'd like to see that as you know if there is there proof of that. Um, also, um, on the um, grievance categories, obviously you you just mentioned that there are some grievances that are more severe than others. So let's say you get a three one one call. On a security, there's a category here called security risk watch group. Um, let's say somebody feels for their safety, and you get a call from it could be 311 from outside the facility or inside. Um, what's the turnaround? Because I've had experience with 311, and sometimes the turnaround is ridiculous. Um, so, I, do, what I is the turnaround? I apologize on the base of uh, on for the city of New York on your unsatisfactory. No, 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 no. It's just sometimes uncertain. Agencies. I'm not saying yours. I'm just saying experiences over the to over years. It's gotten better in certain areas. But just this is let's say a security risk, or let's say somebody's threatened, um, and you get that over 311. What's the turnaround usually? The service desk sends that out to the facility management team, including myself, immediately. Those are investigated immediately. So the operators um, put it in categories. Let's say three one one operator. You're leaving it up to them to decide. Is it no? No. So, so, or so just to clarify, so that complaint is immediately sent to our, my unit. That's something, as the chief just mentioned, we immediately process any time sensitive complaints. We are immediately processing, and the staff at the facility, as well as the chief's team, is going to handle expeditiously. So it gets funneled through us. We process it in our system, and we task it out to the appropriate unit for appropriate follow-up and handling. So you, you, in a matter of an hour, two hours? Minutes. It so could vary. Somebody's always looking at this stuff. So it's a matter of minutes of just filling in the details in our system and sending it yeah, out. Yeah, but sometimes it depends on, on, the, on how the complaint comes across. Obviously, communications can, mm -hmm. can vary. And um, a security risk uh, should be treated like almost like a 911. Not a, you know, so I'm just, I'm just concerned in... in, in um, if, if we, we find that uh, there's some retaliation or there's something, some threat that was made that wasn't addressed in a timely fashion. Um, and, you know, in, in, in visiting Rikers, um, I guess it's about 10 months ago, Keith, uh, we, we did get a lot of complaints from the grievance process that the, the, um, the detainees felt they weren't getting um, proper recourse. They weren't getting it addressed. They were, you know, wrongly accused. I and mean, we hear that from you know a lot. And obviously, sometimes it's it's true. And um, but I'm concerned about the number of grievance officers that you said you were going to, you're going to hire more, or you have hired more. We have hired more. How many more? We have 11 grievance officers in total. 11, and how many? What's the total? You have a total of 11 grievance officers. Total of 11 grievance officers. New hires. They've been on the job. They've been with us for more than a year and a half. So there's a total of 11 throughout the whole system? Yes. One at each facility. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a lot. And, well, and the grievance coordinators, too. So it's grievance officers and it's grievance coordinators. So it's 15 grievance coordinators, 11 grievance officers. They work together collaboratively in each facility. And do you get the average uh, caseload per officer? We don't calculate average caseload. We don't calculate, we don't have caseload guidelines. Uh, you know, the, the way the operations work is that it fluctuates on a day-to-day. -day. And some of our larger facilities, what we do is we'll assign a grievance officer or a grievance coordinator a set of housing areas, and then it will service that housing areas on a weekly basis. Yeah, I'm, ju I'm just wondering, though, if we hired a double amount of grievance officers, would we improve the system? I, the answer would be yes, uh, because th it would be less time, I would imagine. Um, do you agree with that? I mean, we would have to explore, I mean, 
you know, what that would look like and where, the, where would be the most efficient way to use those resources. But that's something we would have to consider and consult with our financial team on what that looks like. All right. Um, I had... It, uh, so the grievance uh, office, let's say um, it, you in the facility as a grievance office, is that 24-7? No. Okay. Well, so let's say you have a grievance and it, you, you want to drop it in the, in the box and, and get it addressed. Can you tell me, is it like the weekends you don't uh, have a, a grievance officer working? or? So they work Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday, they 9 staff, to 5? But inmates also have access to call 311, and we're looking at that seven days a week. So right. if you do drop a grievance in a grievance box um, and it's Friday, then yes, it's likely that that won't be addressed until Monday morning. But if you do have something more pressing you need to address at a specific time frame, then an inmate's going to call 311 instead of dropping a grievance in that grievance box. Um, and just my last question, on the grievance categories, is you said there were some that were more severe than others. Do you have those in, in any category, like red and, you know, you have it color-coordinated uh, or... Uh, a severe, you know, severity number on the on these categories. Well, I mean, it's it, we do have specific categories that, like I said, that are time sensitive. So, like back to what you earlier mentioned, like protective custody, where you're in fear for safety, or sexual allegations, or assault allegations. Those are those are more of our pressing items that we're going to handle immediately. So, can, can are, we get a breakdown of that? Uh, what is um, handled right away versus what is not? Sure. I mean, that would that should be a chart that we have. To, to review, we can, yeah, and, and we'll see if it's you know where the complaints are coming from, what category. So maybe the more severe are being handled, but the the ones that are in middle area might not be, mm -hmm. and that's where the, the problems are coming from. So we just need to see that if you can get that to us. Okay, we'll follow up. Thank you. Okay, do you have anything to say, Chief? Or because I see you got okay. Thank you. Thank you. We've also been joined by Councilmember Lansman as well. Um, I share Bob's frustration with 311, but not relative to you guys. Um, I just I wanted to keep going in terms of a few other questions. I want to just, just start uh, back with another question, which I want to ask earlier, which is how do the categories of grievable versus non grievable get decided, and who decides which, which items go into those categories? So many of these categories have historically always been categories since the inception of the, the grievance system. Um, I mean, what we're doing now is always evolving what categories we need to remove or add based off the trends and metrics we're capturing. So um, if we see that, you know, there are certain grievance categories that's not applicable, um, then we'll remove them. If we are seeing certain trends that we're not capturing that grievance category, then we'll think about adding them. Um, just recently, we've, you know, with the new directive, we changed some categories, even move uh, the grievance process, which was a grievable category, we moved that to a non-grievable category. So we're always looking at this to figure out how to right-size the operation, as well as making sure that the uh, categories reflect the current buckets of grievable and non-grievable. And I noticed that housing was taken out of grievable offense. Is there a reason why you took housing out of that? Right, because that's usually an inmate requesting to be transferred, and that's something that can only be done on a facility level. So that's something that needs to be escalated and handled by the warden's office and their team. Okay, and also I think noise and personal hygiene were also taken out. Is Were those moved? And so, yes, noise was moved because we, we don't hear any noise complaints anymore. Uh, personal hygiene is still a grievable category. It's still a grievable category? It still is a grievable okay. category, yes. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, um, the uh, couple other questions. Um, how do you, when you, when the 311 call comes in, mm -hmm. how do you re, how do you ensure that the adequate follow-up happens after the 311 call comes in? So how do we know that after the call is received that somebody actually went out and went to file, to, went to go and speak to somebody to actually file the complaint? What, what, is there a process in place to ensure that happens? For, for a non-grievable or grievable? For grievable. So yeah, so staff, uh, we'll send that to the staff in the facility. It'll put them on a time, um, a time schedule that they have to respond by seven days. They're always engaging with their supervisor as well, you know, so she's always following up with them to see what the status is of complaints that we're sending to them. So there's always that dialogue as well, in addition to the workload that they're capturing directly from the facility. But when we send something to them that is 311, that is grievable, it's putting them on a time system that they got to respond within seven days. So if they don't respond in seven days, or really before, the, if they don't respond 
respond before seven days and supervisors following up to see what the status of that complaint. And most staff don't want to be in the red. You know, they want to give an inmate a response. They always want to be in compliance, and we're mandating that they be in compliance of the directive, which is to be responsive and provide a resolution in seven days. And and if if you call through and one and you have it's a non grievable mm-hmm. offense, what happens? Then we're sending that. It comes through our unit. Our OCGS hub team is going to track that, put in the appropriate information, and send that to the appropriate unit for further handling. And then, what, if I file, look, if I'm the one who places the call, then how do I know? If, what, like, h- how am I made aware of what's happening in terms of it being sent to the appropriate unit? So, at the inception of the 311 call, the customer service rep at 311 is immediately p- providing you a correspondence number, and that's the same number that the department gets to track the 311 correspondence. So that is kind of the initial acknowledgement that this complaint is being sent to the department for further handling. And I take that complaint number and then I can follow up. How do I know what to do with that complaint number to find out it went to, it's not grievable, it went to this unit because it's about mm-hmm. housing or it's about another non-grievable. How do, what actually, what does that complaint number actually do in terms of me knowing what's the status of my complaint? So it doesn't give you a status, but it definitely gives you confirmation of acknowledgement that this was shared with the department for further handling. Um, In terms of acknowledgement, uh, this is something that we are trying to figure out a plan about how to kind of give acknowledgements for 311. Um, But we we have to continue to have those discussions internally to figure out what's the most efficient way. I would also add that this this is language we added in our recent directive as our further demonstration of support for this. We, you know, believe it's the right thing to do in theory. But we have to figure out what's the most efficient way of operationalizing it to provide an acknowledgement of a 3 on one non-grievable to mm-hmm. the MA population. Is there a reason you couldn't send a staff person to that to that person to say, this is a non-grievable offense, it was sent to this unit, mm-hmm. and somebody from there will be following up with you? Or to have, beyond, I mean, beyond an acknowledgement that my call was received and I have a number and the DOC has acknowledged it, mm-hmm. it seems like that thing gets lost and that person may have no information about mm-hmm. what happened to this <clears throat> non-grievable complaint I made. So I think the question is, is there a process that the DOC could put in place to make sure that person understands, even though it's not a grievable offense mm-hmm. going through the regular process, that they still are getting some some resolution to the complaint they made through 311. Mm-hmm. If I can add, non-grievable investigations are conducted at the facility level, so they are sent immediately to the commanding officer who assigns someone to investigate. Part of that investigation, which will be assigned to a supervisor in the rank of captain, would be to go out and directly communicate with whoever filed the non-grievable complaint, perhaps get a statement if they agree to give a statement, but if not, conduct a face-to-face interview as part of the investigation that they have to provide within a certain prescribed time frame back to the commanding officer and what was the outcome. That happens today? hundred percent, yes. So if I call 311, non-grievable, I make a complaint, it goes to the appropriate unit, facility at the facility. The service desk will forward it out to the respective facility and the facility commanding officer will assign it as an investigation. Okay. Um, I, another another question I had was three one one is seems to be util, so heavily utilized now versus the process of filling out the I mean it's, the, it's sort of the first place people seem to be going. Do you have an understanding of why three one one is being used at, high, at a much higher level than the process of the paper form? The three one one process is open longer than the grievance office. So the grievance office is open Monday through Friday, no holidays, during business hours. 311 is open for the entire time that you're in your housing areas, except for when you sleep. What, what, when, what are the hours, Monday to Friday? For the grievance office, yeah. mm-hmm. that's open on administrative level Monday through Friday during business hours. So 9 to 5? Yeah, Whatever the operation of the facility. The okay. inmate phones are available mm-hmm. throughout the day. So it's just by sheer interaction. You have a more ac- accessibility. You can make more complaints. Mm-hmm. And do you, do you think it represents anything around people's fear of doing it through a formal pro- – I mean, the call isn't – I mean, it's not anonymous, but it's somebody will come talk to you. But it also, to me, would could represent the idea that somebody um, finds that process to be I, – I think – the opposite. I think that it affords you an opportunity to discuss something that you may not want to go and be seen in the grievance office. You can now confidentially make a complaint about whoever you want to talk about in total privacy, anonymously. No one knows and hears what you're saying but you. So I just think it's a... No, we're, 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 we're in agreement on that. That's what I was saying. Yeah, right. right. So I think by that process alone, it's more uh, accessible by the inmates. And I think they uh, like that system a little bit better. 
And it's uh, free, so. Yes. Right. Um, in Horizon, and, and uh, Horizon, is, th is this process the same? If you, for filing a, a grievable, if you want to file a grievance, is there a process? Is it, and is it the same since we've moved, we're moving folks off of Rikers to Horizon? Are we, um, what is the process in terms of filing a grievance at Horizon? So, so ACS oversees the grievance process for residents at Horizon. And do you have any understanding of whether it's, reflects this similar same appeals process same time frames um i i mean i they have the discretion on what's the most appropriate grievance process for them um I, my understanding that i do believe inmate residents are using the 311 system at horizon okay the um just a couple of questions here um what types of complaints trigger the new preliminary evidentiary review stage which precludes appeal and review um, usually issues that um, are totally against department policy. Um, I don't have an example uh, with me, but it's usually something that an inmate is requesting through a grievance that uh, conflicts with department policy. Um, and when staff felt like they thoroughly investigated and the inmate says now wants to appeal your decision and, and staff feel confidently that they thoroughly investigated this matter, they trigger this preliminary evidence review, which immediately gets forwarded to the supervisor and has a quick turnaround of a couple of business days. Um, but it's usually a conflict of uh, department, departmental policy, which things that doesn't need to escalate to the warden's office because there won't be a, a different decision if it was escalated to the grievance, to the warden's office. Okay. Um, we were made aware of one case that was given to the Board of Corrections on February 2nd of last year for an advisory opinion mm -hmm. uh, at the CR or CORC level. It was a case where an incarcerated person wanted to work in the law library and was denied the ability to do so. The BOC, I, I believe, offered an opinion that was contrary to the opinion that was the decision that was rendered. Um, <clears throat> by your statistics, I guess that was the one case that went to CORC if there was only one. Um, can you tell us about it, the department's decision, uh, uh, contrary to that opinion, um, it was a it was a sort of a unanimous vote not to follow the BOC's opinion on that. And can you give us any information about that process? So I'll, I'll jump. I'll start, and then I, she sure. I'll probably add. But uh, we re definitely reviewed the BOC's recommendation and considered their their recommendation. But um, it was uh, a mental health inmate who wanted to work in a law library, and there were concerns, security concerns that. Uh, initiated our response and overall our decision on that particular uh, grievance. But there is policy on why uh, that grievance wasn't affirmed in the inmate's decision. I'll let Chief Scott add. When awarding inmate assignments, the goal is safety and security. So we have to look at all the factors of who the individual inmate is and what exactly is the job that you're applying for. If there are overriding concerns that um, this would be at a risk for the facility to assign you to that. That particular assignment will not be afforded to you for those reasons which may or may not be shared with the particular inmate. However, that doesn't negate other opportunities that are less of a security risk. So although the law library are typical for a very low risk inmate population because you have access to the entire inmate population as they go through that area. But like I said, they can also be considered for less uh, uh, assignments that are not a, pose the same security risk. So in this case, individuals deemed to be a security risk? I don't have the details of that inmate. I'm giving you the policy surrounding awarding inmate assignments. Okay. Um, and, and, and would I be, I'd be correct then to say that was the one person who went to the CRC correct. in the calendar year of 2018? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, the, um, there was some um, reports around sort of having unequal access to the grievance system depending on which facility you are in um, and where you are housed. Can you talk about steps you're taking to increase access? Uh, I think back to the Chief's point, the increased access is 311. I mean, this is directly accessible in all inmates' housing area. It was a call that was made free in 2015. So that, that is our commitment and has been a demonstrated commitment by the department to expand access for inmates to file a complaint. Um, in other facilities, we are strategically looking at, you know, where to uh, apply grievance boxes in areas where there's high inmate foot traffic as another route for inmates to file their complaint. Okay. Um, the 
in terms of um, where, you know, in terms of progress mm -hmm. moving forward here, in terms of ensuring that uh, forms are filled out correctly and this access, I agree with you, 311 is a, is a good access point and open, open longer than the office is. Can you tell us other areas where the Department of Correction is seeking to improve uh, access, improve transparency, and to make improvements, whether it's even just sort of access points for folks and what what we here and the board and others who are here can anticipate in other areas that you're looking for improvement and more efficiency? I think our reporting structures, you know, we want to we want to continue to make granular reports to make sure that we're looking at the root causes of some of these systemic issues. So we definitely want to improve our, our data capabilities to make sure that we're providing good information to help the facilities kind of deal with some of these institutional problems. Um, you know, another level of access to the uh, for the inmates to the grievance system is the grievance staff. You know, these are dedicated, skilled individuals, as I mentioned in my testimony, who engages with the inmate population on a daily basis. And many of them resolve issues before it escalates to a grievance, which I think is um, a tout to their achievements and, and their savviness when it comes to addressing inmate issues. So I think we want to continue to make sure that we're providing the professional development to our staff and making sure that they continue to engage the inmate population. Uh, they, they attend inmate council, so they frequently have their ear to the ground to hear what's going on in all facilities, you know, liaising with facility leadership and making sure they bring any pressing issues um, that's not uh, being caught as a grievance uh, to OCGS supervisory and management team on a daily basis. Thank you. And, and I would ask if this department also could look at simplifying the process and shortening the process in addition to forms and making it easier for folks to fill out forms to also look at a process where, I mean, I, I'll tell you the two things that concern me the most here are A, in, incomplete forms. I mean, there's a, there's a number of things, but in, amongst them, incomplete forms, not having enough information. That, that ensures that people um, who are looking at the board and others who are, who are looking at it have complete information about whether somebody is, um, uh, is, will, wants to go through the appeals process, whether they've met, they've, been, they've gone through this process in a timely manner. And those aren't accusations, but they certainly give us clarity and comfort that uh, the process is working. Um, and and second, to the the low amount of appeals. Well, I understand that there are a number of people that drive the numbers here. Um, there's still mm -hmm. there's still many who are not captured in that 20 person number. And of course, this number rotates as as n n number of people in custody and who's in custody changes. And it strikes me as incredibly low, um, meaning that the process is either difficult to understand mm -hmm. or uh, while I do believe there are probably some mitigations happening and people are getting resolved that that process is long and complicated and perhaps somebody on their own can't go through this process independently. Mm -hmm. So that would be uh, a, you know, areas around simplification of the mm -hmm. process to make it more easier to understand, more efficient. And um, certainly getting complete information would be areas I'd ask um, the department to look at as well. I know the board is looking at, I think we'll probably do another report sometime in the future, later this year. Um, and I think that we would, we would ask for those areas to be looked at amongst others here in this process. Um, Oh yeah, the other thing I want to ask is um, just access to the form, so individuals or people working with them or family members or whoever. Um, have you considered putting the grievance forms online? Uh, no, we, we do have some concerns about posting the grievance forms um, online uh, out of concerns that they, they will probably be used in disingenuous ways. A lot of the forms are for internal staff purposes only and really for if an inmate escalates an appeal. So what we wouldn't want to put is these public, these internal documents on our public web website and have folks misleadingly submitting these forms to various entities as if an inmate either appealed or filed a grievance when in actuality they didn't. So I think we do have some concerns posting um, the forms online, um, but we can definitely take a look at what forms might be, you know, for public consumption. 
um, and we can talk about that internally. Another thing I want to add, council member, is that you know another way we're trying to be very transparent, and I think that's really the goal with the grievance process is to put a lot of this information up front so the inmates are educated or further educated on the process. Is putting up posters, you know, kind of blasting all of the facility housing areas as well as other areas where inmates congregate with posters with clear, simple language forms about how to file a grievance where to talk to the grievance officer, the days they're in from Monday through Friday, and the the another mode of an outlet to file a complaint if you're not into communication with a grievance by you know filing a 311 complaint. Uh, I appreciate that. And um, just to back to your first point, with the concern about people using those in disingenuous ways, can you just clarify what you mean by that? Well, a lot of the forms that we have are appeal forms. Um, so we wouldn't want... Uh, and if for DOC staff purposes only. So we wouldn't want to put the warden's forms, the assistant chief's form, as well as the CRC form up on the public website when these are for DOC internal purposes only. I think there might be some concerns that these forms will be wrongfully used and unfouled in inappropriate ways. And we would not, I think that's something we wouldn't want to let that get away from us. Is it is that the, is the concern that somebody would file on behalf of somebody else Correct. Without Correct. their permission? Correct. That's the possibility that can, can happen, yes. Is it, isn't it? it even possible, if that's the concern, is it even possible to put it up with, I don't know, some some language on there very clearly that it's not a form for public use? I, I mean, I think the, I think, A, I mean, I think the access to the form itself makes some sense because I think people do need some, some occasional assistance with it. But also, um, I think there probably could be a way to make it clear that the version that's online is not for public use or, or something like that. We'll follow up with, the, with you on that as well. Um, I, that concludes I'm, it, my questions. Um, I think we are going to hear from the Board of Corrections. And I, I just want to ask, is, is somebody from CHS here or Healthline Hospitals here? You guys are here. Um, okay. Are you guys testifying? All right. Okay. Um, we just can, can, can we, I think we, we had one question for you. If somebody can, wants to answer. Okay. Thank you. Just state your name and, and we'll, you have to be able to. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, a couple of just questions for CHS. Um, when a third party contacts the department on behalf of a, a person with a grievable issue th through um, 311 or through, a, uh, through the form, can you just tell us how CHS handles that complaint? Sure. So there's an acknowledgment of the complaint. Um, it typically happens within one business day. Um, if it's a holiday or weekend, um, it may take a little bit longer. Can you speak it? To speak sure. Um, so if there's an acknowledgement within one business day. Um, you know, weekends, holidays might take a little longer. Um, if the complaint that comes in is an emergency, um, it's handled in real time. Um, whether it's after hours, weekends, holidays, there's somebody 24 hours a day that will address the complaint. Um, it's raised with site leadership. Um, if it's medical complaint, the head doctor at the facility, um, and it's responded to immediately. And we had a stat, I think, came from the Board of Corrections report. 86% um, of CHS complaints came from the outside, 56% from 311. Um, can you tell us any inclination or reason why that's? 311 is, is definitely the primary means of, of you know, reporting. Um, I, I guess possibly for reasons that were discussed uh, before um, the vast majority come in through 311. Um, uh, for fiscal year 18, 311 was the top. Um, they come in from the public legal aid um, or through DOC. Okay, and um, how many grievances did, you, did CHS receive last year? Uh, complaints for fiscal year 18 was 2,914. 2,914. 914. And what were the categories that registered the highest? Access to care, medical care, and prescription related. And similar question to DOC I had earlier, which is when you receive uh, categories that keep registering high, what steps do you take to resolve those beyond the individual, resolving the individual complaint? Yes, yeah, so we're, all, we're, sorry, we're always working. Um, we partner with both DOC and the board. We've met um, 
as late as this month um, to increase efficiency in the process. We look at trends. Um, if process needs to be changed, it's changed. We address it whatever means is necessary to make the process better. But is, is, do you have a formal process by which you look at the categories and say? Yes. There's a regular meeting, leadership meets and, and reviews. How, and how often? Uh, monthly. Monthly. Um, did you have any feedback on the bills that we're hearing today? Um, just that, you know, as I said before, we aim to respond, acknowledge within a day. Um, other than that, CHS is still reviewing. Okay. And do you have a, is it, is it a similar appeals process for a CHS? Um, it's, there is an appeal process, whether it, for care, I defer to Dr. Rosner, um, but there is an appeal that can get bumped up through leadership and it's looked at again. What is that process? What is uh, that process? The, the complaint is reviewed by leadership. Um, if it's for care, again, I defer to Dr. Rosner. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Zachary Rosner, Chief of Medicine for Correctional Health Services. Um, so uh, the, the written process, there's an, sort of internal complaints that we receive and there's appeal and second opinion requests that are reviewed um, systematically. Um, generally for 311 and outside complaints, we end up talking directly to the patient. And so we are dealing with those things in real time, one-on-one -on -one with patients. And uh, so the, the appeal process uh, exists, but um, uh, it's done kind of face-to-face -face at the facility level with the site le medical leadership. Okay. Um, I think we will end there. Uh, thank you, CHS, for getting up as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you, the DOC. Uh, we look forward to working with you on other ways to improve. We'll follow up with comments on the bills. And, um, and thank you for, for your testimony and your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. We will uh, continue with the Board of Corrections. We're gonna ask you to swear in, so we will have the council swear you in, thanks. And, and again, same thing, if you can please state your name and your title at BOC, thanks. Okay, everyone's hands are raised. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you, you can testify. Good morning, Chair Powers and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice. My name is Martha King, and I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Board of Correction. The board is the city's independent oversight agency for the jail system. It promulgates minimum standards, monitors compliance with these standards, and provides general oversight for the Department of Correction and Health and Hospitals Correctional Health Services. Today, I'm joined by Emily Turner, Deputy Executive Director of Research, and Nashla Rivas-Salas, Senior Director of Re Research, who leads our assessments of DOC's grievance program. When New Yorkers voted to strengthen the board by codifying its mandates in the city charter, those requirements included creating procedures to hear grievances by or on behalf of any person confined under the jurisdiction of the department. Complaints from people in custody are often requests for help on urgent concerns, including healthcare, safety, connection to loved ones, and work. 
New Yorkers recognized that an effective grievance system would help to promote safety and fairness in the jails, identify institutional problems, and address individual issues before they turn to crises. Beginning in 1977, the board collaborated with DOC to create and evaluate a grievance system for incarcerated people. Our involvement continues in multiple ways. Today, when incarcerated people appeal to the highest level, the board provides a recommendation on that grievance matter. The board, per its minimum standards, also provides an appellate opinion in eight categories of DOC-issued restrictions. For instance, in 2018, the board responded to approximately 400 appeals from people in custody or visitors about restrictions they believed they had been unduly issued on their visits. Lastly, board staff provide an impartial review of system patterns and make recommendations to improve the overall grievance system. In June 2018, BOC released our second assessment of DOC's grievance program. We found a system that despite a few improvements in recent years had major structural problems, including a lack of critical policies for responding to tens of thousands of 311 calls each year, unequal access and availability, and a confusing and underutilized appeal process. These structural problems lead to unmet needs, increased tensions, perceptions of unfairness, and unaddressed systemic issues in the city's jails. Today, I'll summarize some of our key findings while discussing recent significant improvements in three areas where DOC must still act. Over the past year, as DOC updated its grievance policy, the board provided extensive feedback and DOC made important improvements. For instance, DOC clarified their process for responding to 311 complaints. New policy requires that staff provide timely acknowledgement of all 311 complaints. Up until now, 311 complaints did not automatically initiate the formal grievance process. These are critical changes since recently 79% of DOC's complaints came through 311, and the number of calls to 311 increased 49% from fiscal year 16 to 17. DOC's new policy also requires they provide more information to people in custody about the process. Information on which complaints are grievable is now automatically provided on grievance forms. New forms have clearer instructions, specifying timeframes for appeal and response, and now clarify which DOC offices handle non-grievable matters. DOC has also hired additional staff. Since January 2017, DOC's grievance office has used an electronic system called Service Desk to track all complaints. Service Desk should help DOC to better comply with its policies and improve accountability. It will also assist in the board's monitoring. The department recently provided us with direct access to Service Desk, and board staff can now check the status of complaints, review patterns, and sample complaints for future audits. Our assessments have found that an increasing number of complaints and nearly 40% of complaints in fiscal year 17 are considered non-grievable, such as complaints about safety and staff unprofessionalism and misconduct. Over the last five years, the number of non-grievable complaints has nearly tripled and the portion of non-grievable complaints has nearly doubled. Complaints about DOC and CHS staff comprised 55% of non-grievable complaints in fiscal year 17. In these cases, complainants are not entitled to a formal resolution or appeal. New policy requires the DOC grievance office to notify the grievant of a referral to a different office, regardless of whether the complaint was made via 311 or on paper. However, grievants are not informed about what the investigation will entail or if they will receive a response. We continue to urge DOC to create a coordinated and transparent system to ensure that people receive written responses about the conclusion of the investigations into their non-grievable complaints. The electronic service desk system should allow for such coordination regardless of which C DOC office is investigating. Our assessment found that the grievance appeal process is broken. If someone files a grievable complaint, the person is entitled to an initial response and the opportunity to appeal three times. Yet nearly 95% of complaints are closed after the initial DOC response. In fiscal year 17, only 20 grievances, or 0.4%, were appealed, and only 10 appeals received a decision at the, at the department's final stage of review. Contrary to policy, none of those appeals were provided to the board prior to DOC's decision. 
As further evidence of poor tracking and management of the appeals, we found that DOC's data shows that there were even more appeals at later stages than the earlier ones. As part of our recent assessment, we audited 262 complaint files. Many of the grievance forms audited by the board were incomplete. 41% of these cases were not timestamped, making it impossible to track compliance with response deadlines. 58% of audited complaints did not indicate if the grievance accepted or rejected the resolution. And of these, 64% were also missing the signature of the complainant. Without this information, it is impossible to know if the grievant wanted to appeal or even received a response. From start to finish, the full appeal process can take more than 10 weeks to complete. We have recommended that DOC shorten and simplify the grievance appeal process. DOC's new policy, instead of shortening the process, adds a new opaque step called a preliminary evidentiary review, making it even more difficult to appeal. We found that five complaint categories made up nearly 50% of all grievances received by DOC. These areas have been the top complaints consistently for the past five years. These frequent complaints concern DOC staff, jail employment, financial accounts, jail sentence calculations, and personal property. Because such stark and persistent patterns signal areas of DOC operations that need to be reviewed and improved, we recommended DOC develop an action plan to evaluate and address these drivers of the top grievance categories. An effective grievance system must use its data to problem solve, to improve conditions, and reduce the number of future complaints and potential lawsuits against the department. Complaints against DOC staff have grown most precipitously by 248% from fiscal year 13 to 17. In fiscal year 17, staff complaints represented 13% of all complaints received by DOC. Therefore, we further recommended DOC develop a system-wide approach on this issue and one that is coordinated, coordinated with the department's significant staff development efforts and the early warning system required by the Nunez consent judgment. These action plans are needed to assist in preventing and decreasing the number of overall complaints, but DOC has not pursued. Our next assessment will be released in June 2019. We look forward to working with DOC, CHS, and the Council on efforts to improve the complaint system for people in custody, and we thank you for taking up these important issues today. We're happy to answer any questions and discuss the proposed legislation. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> can you give us, I want to talk just at the three bills that are before the City Council today. Can you speak to us about any comments, concerns, or feedback that you have on the three bills? Yes. So in terms of the um, uh, bill uh, to require to make the grievance process more efficient, we support the legislation and believe it's critical to have public reporting on this issue. Um, the bill introduces measures the board has previously recommended um, regarding the implementation of an electronic kiosk system for the filing of grievances and improved mechanisms to better record and handle complaints. Uh, we believe the requirements proposed in this bill will increase the efficiency of the system, allowing, to, um, allowing for better documentation and review and monitoring of the grievance process. Um, so we're um, in support of that bill. Um, we also support the bill in relation to 311 complaints made by incarcerated individuals um, requiring um, uh, protections against retaliation and um, responses to 311 complaints. Um, so we support the legislation, um, and it's important to note that DOC's updated directive does already address some of the issues in this bill, which is um, a good sign. Um, under the updated directive, um, individuals are required to receive acknowledgement of all non grievable complaints received. Um, by 311 in three calendar days. Um, it's our understanding this has not yet been implemented, um, but um, we look forward to continuing to work with DOC to identify issues and improve their response to both grievable and non-grievable complaints. So we are in support of the second bill. In terms of the third bill, um, we agree with the spirit and intent of the bill. Um, it's critical to collect information and learn from and share information about the experiences of people in custody and the experiences of people going through the grievance process. Um, however, we have concerns about the board's capacity to conduct a survey of 
every individual who's filed a complaint um, as it would require significant resources from the board, which we do not currently have. Um, further, even limiting the scope of what um, is proposed in the legislation would be highly resource intensive and difficult. Um, for example, if we were to limit the bill to um, to not survey every single individual, but even a sample, sampling in a jail setting is very difficult. Um, if we wanted to, um, if we were to get a representative sample, which we would want to have a representative sample in such a situation, um, by the time we understood exactly how to sample and proportionately and correctly, many individuals may have already left custody. Um, so sort of how this how this kind of survey would get would be accomplished is something that we're looking forward to working together with your staff um, to figure out what makes sense in terms of um, how we could incorporate their perspectives and feedback and recommendations from people in custody um, we have already publicly committed and um, will be completing an annual assessment of the grievance process in an ongoing um, way and are actively working to um, incorporate um, the perspectives of people in custody into our annual assessments and we believe that one of the goals um, Council, Me Council member Ambry Samuel, Samuel mentioned at the start of the hearing was um, to make sure um, you know we understand what is actually happening and one of the ways that we've um, been able to do that is through our auditing um, which may be um, a more effective approach to get to um, to more information about compliance with policy. Okay, thank you. Um, and we will um, have our staff reach out to talk about the uh, concerns on on uh, on the last bill you discussed, and we will uh, also, if there's any other recommendations in terms of even just amending the bill to make it um, accommodating to the purpose you're serving, we'll, we'll be happy to see um, language changes as well. Can you just talk to us about um, the new directive and implementation of it and your feedback on ter in terms of how implementation is going in terms of the new directive and the changes? So the department's directive went into effect on December 10th and has not yet been fully implemented. That said, um, much of this directive was formalizing many of the structures and procedures that were already in practice, such as the merger of the Office of Constituent Services and the grievance staff. Um, in terms of implementation, we know that the department has trained all of the OCGS staff on the new directive, and they report that staff are familiar with the procedures and timeframes. Um, the department is still in the process of of drafting and finalizing the inmate handbook and other education materials, which will be important to educating people in custody about the new policy. Um, and um, we know that they are working on a poster um, to, to distribute across all facilities that will explain the new process and further clarify um, grievable versus non-grievable matters. Um, one of the major changes, as we've discussed um, in the new directive, is the requirement that OCGS staff provide acknowledgement of non-grievable complaints. Um, acknowledgements are not currently being provided as required by the new policy, um, and DOC reports that there are they are currently exploring sort of the staffing and potential technology solutions that could assist with implementing this practice. Um, that's you know one one benefit to the kiosk system could be um, better communication with people in custody about the process and um, receiving a more direct um, way to check on the status of complaints. So um, we so that is one area where we're concerned that it doesn't appear that there is a plan yet. Um, for how they will come into compliance with the new requirements of the policy and we think it is important that the department provide some acknowledgement. Um, I think that will go a long way to reducing the number of calls to 311. If you imagine you call 311 and you don't get a response or you don't have, um, have some documentation that the department has in fact received that matter and is moving forward it forward with it or which department there is moving forward with your complaint, I could imagine you're going to be calling over and over again to see um, until that issue is resolved. So 
receiving at least that initial acknowledgement will go a long way to, I think, reduce overall reducing the number of complaints. Um, but we don't yet have a plan, or we are not aware of a plan for how that will be implemented. Okay, thank you. And um, I want to, just, from your testimony, you mentioned a confusing and underutilized appeal process, something that we had, uh, I had, I guess, um, uh, discussed with the with the department in their testimony, which was that <clears throat> you mentioned, I think, stats from FY 2017. Uh, I think the stats we discussed were from last year. Um, it's it struck me, but I but I certainly stand corrected and and willing to to be educated otherwise that the the appeal process was being underutilized relative to the number of complaints that were coming in. Can you talk to us about when you say confusing and underutilized appeal process? Are there concerns about why it's underutilized and what concerns you have about it being confusing? So, um, one of the findings from the our last assessment. Um, that has actually since been addressed is updating the, the actual forms um, so that you can clearly indicate when you want to appeal. Um, prior versions of the form, um, there was no sort of explicit way on the form to indicate that you were seeking the appeal process. And so um, that is one improvement that has been made um, since our assessment. But I think that, that um, understanding those steps in the process, I don't think that that has been, um, that people in custody fully understand all of the steps that go into an appeal. And um, in terms of initiating an appeal, um, that was a barrier. Um, when you get a response and there's no clear way to, written way to acknowledge that you want to move forward. So the forms that today have, I think one form has yes, no, and I want to appeal, which I, I, I don't know why the, the, what the no means, but is what says yes, no, I want to appeal. That's, in, that's, in, that's since December of 2018? Yes. Yeah. And <clears throat> so that would be one way to lead one to understand how to, that they can go through an appeal process through that. Are there other barriers that you see to the appeals process today beyond that? In terms of initiating and having somebody understand that there is an appeals process and how to go through it? So I'm not sure that we have enough information to answer that question yet. I, I think the data, I'm mean, just focusing on this issue for a bit more. Um, you know, the, the data that, what is it, um, 20 people filed 2,000 complaints suggests the fact that people are filing multiple and multiple complaints could also represent the fact that the appeal process isn't being utilized. Um, I think because so few people have actually used it, we don't know what is the problem in getting through the process. As you know, we've only received one appeal at the highest level, um, and we've never seen any others. Uh, the data also suggests just a confusing pattern or a lack of information on the department side about what's actually happening with the appeals process. So, you know, the fact that, um, and then what year was that? Fiscal year 17 or, so there was, at the first level at the IGRC, we, there was one appeal. Then at the next level, there were nine appeals. And then at the final level, there were 10. Um, I don't know how that was possible. Um, it, maybe that first step was being skipped, which also might suggest that there still is space to even eliminate a, a step in the process as we've suggested. Or there was misinformation related to? Yes, or that, and, and or that, yeah. I, I just want to clear, clarify that point is that the third part of the process had 10 appeals, but the first appeal had one, is that correct? First level. Yeah. Right. Meaning that somebody either it either skipped the process or there was not tracking of who went through. So and the first level of appeal was the IGRC, which uh, Mr. Boyd addressed and said that um, they weren't really happening, the hearings weren't really happening because new information wasn't coming out from these hearings. Also, I think the hearings required um, grievance coordinators, officers, and inmate reps to be part of it and not not every facility had all the staff that was needed. Um, since then, the department has now hired additional staff and 
as was mentioned, you know, there is now an officer at every facility where in the past there wasn't, and it's an officer dedicated specifically for grievance, where in the past it had been a programs officer was being shared among all these different offices. Um, and so I think that might have been a reason why that wasn't happening. But. Okay, and are there um, other recommendations in terms of how to improve the process for people understanding or taking advantage of the appeals process? Well, I think um, critical to understanding all aspects of the new directive will be the education materials that are distributed to people in custody, which have not yet gone gone out. So once those are in place, I think that should make a difference. Got it. Okay. Um, are there, we, we talked a little bit earlier about grievable versus non-grievable, which are going to different categories. Has, has the board made any recommendations in terms of categories that should be grievable or non-grievable in terms of how the categories are sorted out? Um, we haven't really made recommendations on what should be grievable or non-grievable, but we have been working with the department to um, add additional subcategories to the to the grievable and non-grievable categories to have a better understanding of what type of complaints. Um, so that's something that comes up during our quarterly meetings that we have with them. So for instance, the staff complaints was a very broad um, category, and so now the department has added additional um, subcategories that will give a better idea of what type of staff complaints are coming in. So it's been, that's been, you've, had, you've recommended that's been accepted by them and is starting I guess yeah. now, in terms of understanding more granular, okay. right. um, the um, in terms of the we I raised an issue earlier with the BOC issuing an opinion on the like the one case last year, uh, which was I think the BOC came out with an opinion and contrary opinion offered. Can you give us any information about that either particular instance or end I should say? Um, uh, the board's feeling about how they participate in that process in terms of appeals, whether they're, you, the board believes there should be earlier intervention or opinions offered or other places where they could be um, participants in the appeals process? So I think um, absolutely we'd be happy to be involved earlier in the process, especially when um, the numbers look this way. So if there's only 10 people or one person getting to the final level, we would like to know what earlier on in the process, what are the um, appealed issues. In that case that you're referring to, um, we urged our opinion, our recommendation to DOC was to reconsider their decision on preventing uh, this person from working in the law library. Um, and it was not accepted. He, uh, I mean, I can give you some more. I mean, this this person uh, was about 56 years old. Uh, we didn't believe any of his characteristics suggested a high security risk. And um, he, in fact, you know, in the documents, um, there was not only concern about security risk, but concern about his mental health status. Um, and so from our perspective, this was um, not only an issue of um, security, but also potentially an issue of discrimination. Um, so we, we wrote a detailed opinion, and but this is how the process works. And of course, DOC is, um, can disagree with our opinion, but at least our opinion is there, and this person can use that opinion in whatever additional um, appeals or action he takes. Um, I should also note that he had previously worked in a law library, which was another, I thought, important factor in the consideration uh, given to him in this case when he was asking again. He was in a, a new facility, so he, in a different facility, he was allowed to work in the law library. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, if the board receives a complaint directly, how is that handled? So we receive, um, let me step back and say, so as I noted in the testimony, there's sort of three, our three main functions in the system are to one, provide this additional recommendation when people appeal to the highest level. Um, 
then to also respond to appeals in these eight categories of restrictions, like visit restrictions, could be restrictions on your ability to practice your religion or go to the law library. Um, and then we do these large scale audits and reviews aimed at understanding and improving the overall system. So that's the, our primary function. Throughout all of that, we also take complaints in five ways, from staff and from people in custody, from advocates, from friends and family. We take them in person at our office, in person in the jails, by letter, online, phone, um, and people also come testify at our hearings and could file, a, we could take a complaint in that way. Um, when we get those types of complaints, what we're looking at are really three issues. One, does that complaint need to be referred out? So is there a potential issue of corruption? Do we need to refer it to DOI? Is it an, is it an immediate medical need? And we need to get that to CHS. Um, two, we're looking at whether or not the DOC and correctional health complaint process has already been used by the person and has that has the DOC and CHS complaint process failed and then do we need to step in because of that um, yeah so does that answer your question in, in terms of if you receive a if somebody skips 311 and says to you I have a, gr a grievable offense I want to make a complaint you then send that to the Department of Corrections, or how does that how does that then go into the process, which is established by the DOC? Yes, we would send it to OCGS. Okay. Um, that, just to add, that's one of the things that we discuss in our quarterly meetings when complaints come in. Um, we uh, we discuss issues that either come up from our staff in the facilities or from grievance staff in the facilities. And then we go over what's the proper way to handle those and how do we refer those back to the department when we get them. Okay, thank you. And just a follow-up question from earlier, actually. When, when was BOC added in as a, pro a step in the process in terms of issuing a f an opinion at the CR or the last appeal? I'm looking at Laura in the audience because she knows the history best here. Um, and it actually, our role actually used to be stronger. Could maybe could we get back to you with the specific sure. um, timeline? Because our role has changed, and as I understand it, it actually used to be much more central to the process. Okay, can you uh, both follow up us with that changes in that process in terms of the changes to BSU's role, and also any information in terms of how many uh, appeals are, uh, how many times you have issued opinions on appeals and potentially outcome. In, the, in our history, yes. Yes, that'd be great. Um, are, is the BOC, has, has the BOC considered minimum standards related to, uh, to grievances? Um, yes. Um, I think that, you know, it has been recommended to us actually quite recently by legal aid. Um, and I think it is something that the board would like to review as an option. Currently, we're pursuing um, a different line of rulemaking, and that's focused on restrictive housing, and uh, our capacity is all there right now. Okay. So, but potentially in the future, you'd be looking at it. And you have, a, you have a, another assessment coming out in June of 2019, I think you're, that's what your testimony says. Are, um, are there other recommendations that you've been considering in, in addition to the ones that you've put out recently? That you would be part, of, that could potentially be part of the 2019 assessment, or is it, or does it follow? I mean, it can follow the assessment, of course, but um, other things that you have suggested or recommended that have not been yet adopted, or you have not made a formal recommendation on. So um, we use the quarterly meetings to make recommendations, such as not, that, um, similar to what Nashla referenced, of you know, when we have smaller recommendations. Um, about how we work together or about um, how things are being recorded. We can make those recommendations in quarterly meetings and the department has been very responsive um, in working with us on those. Um, and for the assessment, um, in general, we try and make data-driven recommendations, so we would want to take a complete um, look at the data um, for our next round of recommendations in that assessment. Um, but we've also, with the directive process, um, I think we went through at least three rounds of very detailed, extensive feedback. Um, not all of our feedback made it into the new directive, um, but, but a lot of it did. Um, and so I think keeping the dialogue open between BOC and 
um, OCGS has been helpful in in making a lot of um, improvements. I will also just add on that you know what we try to do is as issues are identified then modify our approach with the next assessment so you know one of the issues obviously or two of the issues that we should look at and sample for in the upcoming audit is under better understanding the lack of use of the appeal process you know that could be one focus where we try to dive deeper and better understand that and then also an issue that we tried to look at um, more deeply in the last report, but I still think we need to go further, is the issue of the non-grievable complaints and really uh, focusing in and auditing on those. So in other words, past recommendations can help shape, um, issues of concern can help shape what the next report uh, looks like. Um, I want to thank, thank you for that answer. I, I wanted to just follow up. You, you have a chart that you submitted with your testimony, resolutions and appeals, grievance resolution st stages, with a party chart that is almost, I'll hold it up, it's almost entirely blue, that says um, nine, uh, informally resolved. 95% of complaints were closed after the initial OCGS response. Can you explain what you mean, what that means, and what, in this case, I think we had a conversation about informally versus formally, but mm -hmm. what does that mean to be informally resolved? So that means that um, an individual filled out a grievance form um, and they received a response from a grievance coordinator, and that was the end of the matter. So it, there was no further appeal. There was um, no hearing. No. Um, yeah. It informally used to mean the response directly from the grievance coordinator without a hearing. Formal response would be considered if a hearing happened at the previous IGRC level that no longer exists. Can you, can you appeal an informally resolved complaint? Yeah, you would appeal. So the first interaction, the initial response would be the informal response. And if you disagreed with that, you would appeal to the next level. In the old directive, in the old system, the next level would be the IGRC. In this new directive, the next level is appeal to the warden. OK. Um, so yeah, now all responses, even just the initial response they receive from a grievance coordinator, uh, that initial form is considered a formal response under the new directive. Okay. Um, we, um, I think, first of all, I want to thank you for your report and also um, um, your recommendations as well. I think that some of the comments and questions earlier were, I think, shared amongst um, how the appeal process work, making sure they're transparency. I'm sort of thankful to the DOC for adopting some of those and also for staying here and, and hearing testimony as well. Um, I think as we look at the bills here in the City Council, we certainly will um, work with both the DOC and the BOC around um, questions, comments, or concerns that you have related to that. Um, um, but uh, so I'm, I'm going to stop my questions right there. I think Councilmember Holden has a question. Yeah, well. I'm sorry I, I missed uh, a good deal of, the, of your testimony because I was over at a, uh, another committee meeting uh, where I had three bills so uh, being heard. So um, I just have, I missed, um, maybe I missed it in the previous testimony, but with, you, on, when you audited the 262 complaints, 41% um, of these were not time stamped. Why would that happen? Is there not enough machine, time to have machines, or what's going on? Um, I think it could be because either a machine wasn't working or, as Mr. Boyd mentioned, something as simple as the machine didn't have ink. Um, so the machine didn't have ink, but, but couldn't somebody sure. take, like, um, you know, a signature and just stamp it with... Uh, you know, some kind of rubber stamp that would actually, somebody could actually hand write it in there. Wouldn't that be like another step if the machine didn't have ink? They could actually fill it out? Yeah. You've seen those rubber stamps. I mean, that's old technology, but you've seen them where you can actually make one up for pennies and actually fill it in. Because I, I, I just find that's 41% that's alarming, and that needs to be addressed with some solution other than, well, the machine doesn't have enough ink. Right. I, I agree, absolutely. There should have been a, yeah. a secondary system here if yeah. uh, the machines aren't working or there's not ink. Right now, since, they're, since DOC is using an electronic system, um, this shouldn't be an issue uh, because it'll be 
It'll be obvious the when so someone's so responding in the electronic system, they won't need to timestamp. Is that, am I saying something true? Well, unless the, um, no, they still- Could you get the mic closer? I can't, it's Sorry, they still, they still have to timestamp. They're still required to timestamp. If they receive, if they receive paper. a paper form. So they have to timestamp. So can we come up with a rubber stamp uh, solution just for you know the interim? I mean, just is that possible? Because I don't want to. We don't want to see another forty percent. Right. Just because then it's impossible to track. Then it could be at any time. Right. And then we we can't recognize the abuses. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bob, you got to go out and buy him a stamp, my friend. Um, Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to end my questions there because I know we are a little bit limited on time here in the room today. Thank you to BOC for your testimony, and we'll follow up with you on, on the bills as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel, we have uh, two folks. We have Dale Wilker from Legal Aid Society, and we have Brooke Menchel from Brooklyn Defender Services. All right, thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, we will, we're gonna put you on the clock, I think just momentarily. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll give you five minutes, uh, more than the, the, the normal three. Um, and then we'll obviously have questions and we'll, we'll ask follow-ups as well. So we'll just wait for, for our folks to be ready to do the clock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great, um, and we can start in any order. I usually go left to right. And um, just if you can share your name and your affiliation, and then you can read your testimony. Uh, my name is Dale Wilker. I'm a staff attorney with the Legal Aid Society's Prisoners' Rights Project. I'm joined here by Kayla Simpson, also a staff attorney at Prisoners' Rights. My name is Brooke Menschel. I'm the Civil Rights Counsel at the Brooklyn Defender Services. Great, thank you. Chairman Powers, members of the committee and staff, we submit this testimony on behalf of the Legal Aid Society and thank Chairman Powers and members of the committee on criminal justice for the opportunity to present our, our views on this very important issue of reforms of the grievance system of the New York City Department of Correction. We support the three bills under consideration today, seeking to improve the jail grievance system more broadly, we urge the council to incorporate the following principles for the DOC grievance process in any legislation that it enacts. In order for a grievance to use and quickly resolve jail problems, the grievance system must be explained in plain and simple language. DOC issued a new grievance directive last month. While it makes some improvements, uh, in other ways it's worse. It certainly fails the basic test of being easy to read. And in this case, uh, a mem uh, member Samuel is uh, not alone. Recently, five PRP attorneys met and tried to understand the new directive. We are still unsure as to how it works or how to advise our clients. The grievance process, secondly, must be accessible. We support member Ayala's bill to install electronic kiosks. The locations of these kiosks should be easily accessible by putting them in every jail housing area and the jail law libraries. Third, the grievance process must be completed quickly. The new process can take up to 100 calendar days to complete. 
that is longer than ever before. There are many ways to get to a simple, complete process, such as shortening response times and eliminating multiple steps of appeal. We think that the best solution is requiring the grievance system that takes no more than a month to complete and has far fewer steps in the process. We recommend only two steps. First, the jail grievance filing, and second, the appeal to central office headquarters. This is exactly how the jail medical grievances have worked for years, two steps. Third, the, uh, the grievance process must be free from retaliation for using the grievance system. This protection is vitally important. We support legislation which addresses this issue, but the new directive has a provision about frivolous use that could easily deter or be used to punish someone for filing a grievance. Any bill should expressly prohibit the department from actually retaliating against or punishing someone for filing a grievance. Next, the grievance process must accept third-party complaints. Complaints in any form to DOC from attorneys, family, or others on behalf of the incarcerated person should be treated the same by the grievance process as a grievance filed by a person in jail. Thank, thank you for the additional time. The, the department's directive is not clear what happens to third-party complaints from the th city's 311 hotline or by email or letters or ordinary phone calls from attorneys, family members, or others. We support Chairman Powers' bill to clarify the legal effect of 311 calls, and we have submitted some written suggestions and amendments to strengthen and further that goal. A word about medical grievances, which is the source of confusion to many people in jail. The medical grievance process is and has always been separate and apart from the DOC grievance process because health care is provided by the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation and the Health Department. Therefore, DOC properly rejects any grievances filed with the department about medical treatment. However, the council should mandate that DOC forward all complaints about jail medical and mental health services directly to the proper agency, which is Correctional Health Services at HAC, and that these forwarded complaints be treated the same by CHS under its existing procedures as any other complaint about medical treatment. Thank you for the committee's attention to this long neglected topic. I am. Ms. Simpson, are happy to answer any questions which the committee may have. Thank you. I will move on and then I'll ask questions. I just want to note, I think you, in your testimony, mentioned attaching amendments to those bills. I don't think we have that as part of your testimony, oh, but, but I think our staff, oh, I stand corrected. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Powers and other members of the council for hearing our testimony today and for considering this very important issue. As the council is aware, the ability to access and submit grievances is critical to preserving the rights of our clients and all incarcerated individuals, and also to resolving issues that they encounter in the city's jails. Nonetheless, the DOC, system, the DOC grievance system, we believe, is highly flawed, and despite recent amendments and revisions to the system, it remains incredibly problematic. The reality that our clients face in the city jails is far different than the reality that we heard described on the first panel. What they encounter is an archaic, confusing system that is very difficult, if not impossible, to navigate. The concerns that we have are multifaceted. First, the process itself, as we've heard repeatedly today, is very confusing. The 28-page directive that was issued in December is difficult to understand for our clients and as we've heard just now from legal aid and earlier today from Councilwoman Ayala, is very difficult to understand for the advocates who seek to assist our clients as well. Further, information is not readily available to people who do try to access the system. We heard a bit of discussion about the forms not being attached to the online <coughs> copy of the directive, which we think is highly problematic, and data on appeals that has been discussed quite a bit earlier today demonstrates how hard it is for our clients to understand what it is that they should do even if they get past the initial stage. Even if people do figure out how to access the system, 
the actual process does not match what is laid out in the directive. The forms themselves are largely inaccessible. Officers, we hear reports that officers refuse to provide the forms, that the OCGS is not in particular housing areas, that our clients have never encountered somebody who has, uh, who works for the grievance office. Um, we also hear that forms are not available in housing units or other areas that they are supposed to be under the directive. These concerns are even more problematic for people who are housed in specialty units where often the only access to, to submit a grievance would be through OCGS and we hear that they do not come around to those units as regularly as they're mandated to under the directive. Third, even if a person does manage to submit a grievance, we hear very, uh, we hear consistently from our clients that they think doing so may be pointless. They rarely have ever received an acknowledgement and a much, uh, much less any type of substantive res response that will actually address or resolve their issue. The new policy, even though these concerns have been existent for quite a while and we and legal aid and others have made the department aware of them, the new policy does not resolve most of these issues. Our clients continue to face the same hurdles to understanding, accessing, submitting, and resolving complaints. Just last week, one client told us that since October he has submitted 35 grievances and he's not received an acknowledgement or a resolution to even a single one. We can and must do better. We support the council's efforts to increase transparency and accountability and to embrace the appropriate use of technology, including by allowing traffic tracking and accessing information about grievances. We have a few specific suggestions to the bills that are included in our, in our written testimony. Thank you for your attention to this important issue. We applaud the council's efforts and we echo the concerns raised by legal aid. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for both testimony. And we have, I think, your recommendations inside your testimony as well. <laughs> um, the first question I wanted to ask was uh, just to the point you had made about one client who had 35, um, had made 35 complaints, had no receive, had received, had not received any follow up to that. Can you give us any, without violating any sort of personal information here, but can you give us a sense of what types of grievances that that, that individual is filing for? So I believe that there were a few that related to housing um, conditions and perhaps one related to medical, but I'd have to check. I could get, I could follow up after. Okay, thank you. And to the point around, um, you know, I think our, our clients frequently ask us whether they should bother submitting grievances since they never hear back and request help from our office to follow up on their behalf. What is the type of follow-up that you do on behalf of somebody who files a grievance, doesn't hear, or doesn't feel like they've gotten the appropriate response? Sure. What is that? What is that process look like? Sure, so it depends a little bit on the type of issue. Um, our social workers and our jail services staff are the initial first, um, first defense and first advocates. So we will often go directly to the DOC uh, unit that we believe would be responsible for resolving the issue, whether it be custody management or health and hospitals, if it's, if it's medical, um, sometimes raising issues with, um, with the general counsel's office and on occasion to the grievance office. Um, but almost across the board, no matter what efforts we make within DOC, just frankly, we usually are not able to resolve an issue until we bring in the Board of Correction. Okay, and on restrictive housing units, you mentioned that <clears throat> there's no viable alternative to submitting a grievance from restrictive housing. Um, are, is there a suggestion in terms of another way for an individual? To sure. Restrictive housing to file a grievance. So I'm, I think that um, we may want to add something to what I'm about to say, but initially, under the directive, the the OCGS is mandated to come around with certain frequency, and I think that we just don't believe that that's happening as it's mandated. And actually, having those visits regularly and going in and going either door to door or making their presence known in a way that people don't fear retaliation if they actually say, oh, hi, I want to talk to you, that would be an important initial step. Um, we've, we hear that 
from a few people, uh, we've heard things like, oh, they may come in, but somebody just stands there and says, does anybody need to talk to us? And I can't be the one guy yelling out of my out of my unit saying, hey, yes, I do. So even if it was to say, make sure people don't fear retaliation and that they know there is an opportunity to have those conversations confidentially without identifying themselves and putting a target on their back, that would be a, a good first step. Thanks. I have a couple of follow-ups, but I want to ask, like Councilmember Holden, ask. Uh, yes, thank you for your testimony, Brooke. Um, oh, that one client that you said 35 complaints never got a response. Over what time period was that? That's what he reported to us, and what we understand from his situation. And it was since October until you know a few weeks, two weeks ago, maybe. So that's that's quite serious. That and and your answer from. The board was. Uh, we haven't yet followed up about the board okay. um, on that particular okay. client. Now we we understand that this process is complicated. The grievance process. Are there any uh, other cities or states that do it right uh, that we could look at and maybe study their process and say, hey, let's pick up on that one. It's a little bit more direct and understandable. Well, the New York City Department of Health does it right. They have a two-step grievance process that takes about three to four weeks to complete. And, and that you think would definitely work in this, uh, or actually was worth a try in, in this system? Certainly, because uh, an extended grievance process, um, particularly when inmates are um, don't understand it or are incapable of understanding it, and remember there are a sizable percentage of inmates who have serious mental illnesses, 40% or more, a, a very simple grievance process is, is really important because you can get stuck in the appeals. And from a lawyer's perspective, uh, what makes this critically important is the application of the federal law, which says if you don't complete a grievable issue in the grievance process, you cannot get justice in federal court for a, for a federal civil rights violation. Mm -hmm. So you, you think that by the, the time period so long, that many of the same inmates are putting in the same complaints. And that's what we've heard some of that. Um, that if we shortened it, we could eliminate many complaints possibly. Is that plausible? So, I mean, I would agree with that. I also think that there are a number of um, just sort of fundamental problems. Like we've heard that people are um, regularly using the grievance process, submitting things over and over again, often about the same issue. But if they're not receiving an acknowledgment then, or a receipt or a resolution to the issue, that's how they are still attempting to actually go through the process. But then we hear on the flip side, and there's some language in, uh, in the directive, I believe, about the later submissions won't necessarily be counted as grievances. So people are a little bit just sort of between a rock and a hard place trying to figure out if they don't get a resolution, what's next? They can call their lawyers, especially if they're represented by our offices, but there's not a very clear, okay, you submitted it automatically. It, um, you can, the second grievance on the same issue is considered an appeal, and if you don't receive a response, then you've exhausted for purposes of federal law or um, generally for purposes of a grievance being closed in this um, for data counting purposes. I think on the issue of whether there are other models, off the top of my head, I, I can't think of which one it is, but there are a number of cities, and we'd be happy to follow up, that have two-page directives that say, it's a two-step process. This is the form. If you can't access the form, you can submit it on a piece of paper that includes your name, your identi ad identifying number, and the date, and information. And then you will get a response in 10 days. If not, if you don't get a response, you should consider that your request was denied, and then you can submit an appeal in the same way. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that would be a good idea if you can get back to us. Sure. Right now, because we'd like to study some success stories rather than, you know, rather than just hypothetical, let's try that. I think it does, ha I think we all agree here, uh, at least um, I do, and I, I can speak for others here that um, have already said it, that they, it has to be simplified. This is much too, um, you know, I mean, look at this thing. <laughs> this is complicated, and this needs to be simplified, and communications are important to, um, to everyone here. So, um, yeah, if you can get back on some of the other, uh, you know, state or local uh, facilities that are doing it right, we, we'd appreciate that. Thank you.
Thank you. I just have a few more questions. One is on uh, just generally on the categories. I've asked this to everybody, but do you feel like the categories that make sense in terms of what's grievable and non-grievable? Well, we support excluding certain categories from the grievance process because they are essential civil rights issues that that are probably not best resolved in the grievance process itself. I mean, uses of force and assaults and things like that do, well, especially uses of force trigger their own investigatory process, and that plays out, and that's been the subject of numerous federal court uh, oversight. Um, what strikes us as a little uh, unclear on the, on the grievable side is that uh, there's a category called other, which is, I suppose, a catch basin. But if you put in grievable as other, um, then you sort of open the, the door to some judge later on saying, well, we think that should have been grievable because it said other. And that, that any sort of uh, minutiae could be, could be thrown into this uh, exhaustion of administrative remedies hopper that federal law imposes. Um, so I think the grievable category should be well-defined and exclusive and the non-grievable uh, categories we don't have particular uh, ob objections to. Um, obviously, if they're outside the grievance process, that makes it simpler. But um, they should also be well-defined. Uh, there's an issue called housing, and I didn't know until today that that meant transfers from one housing area to another as opposed to something else about the housing area or getting into housing from a bullpen that you've been s kept in for days or weeks at a time, and that's unclear, and that's, that should be specifically spelled out. Okay, thank you. And the, uh, I think you had made a point about third parties relating to um, o OCGS tree complaints filed by third parties, attorneys, advocates, public officials, BOC, family members as a trigger for the grievance system. Am I right saying that's not the case today? A family member calls uh, or? It's, un it's, it's, it's unclear. The, pr the previous directive, uh, going back to the mid-2000s, clearly excluded third-party complaints where they had been accepted in some ways before, although it wasn't quite as important back then. Um, but yes, that's, that's another way to make the grievance process work. If, uh, if, an, if a representative of the inmate can present the grievance to the department and shepherd the appeal process, uh, through and the department would accept that as if the inmate themselves had had filed the grievance just as lawyers do in court all the time on behalf of a client um, that would make make it more certain that the grievance process could be completed got it and I know the, the we'll, we'll, we'll follow up with the department to find out what that what's what's allowable here and also um, you know I think they had registered a complaint earlier about putting the forms online related to the way that could be used, and I would imagine that concern gets reflected here as well. So, but we will follow up with them as well on that. So, I think may, you, may I just say one thing sure. about that? Previous directives have always put the forms online. Um, the department could simply put a watermark on the forms that says sample uh, or, you know, some other thing that says that it's not to be used for filing a grievance. Um, and and we've provided you an example of that with our uh, with our testimony. Right, sample, right. Yeah. Sample. I agree. I think I made a similar comment and earlier. We, um, and we didn't make that that particular document. That was provided us, to us by the department. Got it. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, on retaliation, have you heard about retaliation for anybody who's making a complaint? We hear about it all the time um, on any number of issues, not just grievances, but people are threatened with grievous physical harm by officers um, if they complain about the officers. And then many times we hear, and we heard this this week, that it actually occurs as the inmate predicted. Um, some inmates we know have been killed by officers. Uh, the most significant one was a few years ago when an inmate at the infirmary was beaten to death. Um, so that is a real problem. Ordinary retaliation, uh, uh, discouragement from filing grievances, I think that plays a, a, a significant role. We know also that in the inmate culture, there's the old expression that I can remember back from the 80s, uh, snitches get stitches. And with the activity of gangs in the, in the jail that has been reported by 
the Department of Investigation and the Inspector General, um, that, that can be a real problem. Also, because as the Inspector General reported, a significant portion of the department's officer corps uh, are gang members themselves. May I just add to that, in addition to people who are directly threatened with retaliation, the overall chilling effect across the board for our clients who hear that someone else was threatened with retaliation is pretty extreme. So even if they're not hearing it directly, um, it does prevent people from reaching out and trying to file grievances. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to just ask one or two more questions here. One is, you, you had a recommendation from Legal Aid Society. CRC's decision should be automatically forwarded to BOC for its review regarding conformity with city rules. Can you explain that recommendation? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of it. It was a, just, uh, there was a recommendation in here that CR, the CORC decision should be automatically forwarded to BOC for its review regarding conformity with city rules. I just want to better understand that recommendation. Well, it, 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 it basically is, uh, speaks to the right hand uh, telling the left hand what's going on. If, if, the, uh, if the Central Office Review Committee makes a particular decision on a grievance and the grievance has a, particularly, um, uh, a particular policy implication uh, that, that shows that, for instance, uh, the, the rules weren't followed, uh, the person wasn't allowed to access mandated services, that obviously has to implicate DOC staff for not following the rules that that that, that generated the grievance in the first place, and uh, you know, effective department also works on uh, on the other side. Uh, the inmates can grieve and have their problems resolved, but if it shows that there's a problem with staff not following department procedures or rules or breaking the law, then the department's other function is to discipline that staff which is why on the retaliation end, we think the council should enact as part of the legislation against retaliation specific either administrative um, penalties that must be imposed for retaliation or criminal penalties. Okay, thank you. Thank you for both of your testimony here today. Uh, we, I think we have your recommendations both in writing and, and from the process as well. So thank you for uh, your advocacy and, and your testimony as well. And we'll certainly follow up on your recommendations. Thank you, Chairman thank you. Powers. Thanks so much. <clears throat> uh, that is the conclusion to our hearing today. I want to thank uh, DOC for being here to testify and staying, BOC as well. Thank you to everybody who came here today to share their thoughts on the grievance process. We will certainly look forward to the POC's, uh, I think, June 2019 uh, assessment. Also, continue to follow up with all those who had recommendations in terms of language for today's hearing. I want to thank Council Member Holden for, for coming back and staying. Thanks so much. This is concluded. <laughs>